Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. This is part two of our look at the early days of Red Dwarf. Part one was last week. If you haven't listened to that yet, you should get that one first, because otherwise you're just jumping into the middle. It won't make any sense. We've already discussed some of the backstory of how Red Dwarf came about. We've looked at the career of Norman Lovett. We've looked at Craig Charles. We still have Chris Barry and Danny John Jules to come, as well as finishing our conversation about our specific episode, Series 1, Episode 3, Balance of Power. So if you're all caught up, let's get straight back into it. All right. Well, look. I tell you what. Let's get back to our episode, and we'll we'll talk about the others as we as we uh, as we move through. But this scene, so this scene in the corridor with uh, with Rimmer and the cat, it gives mm. us a good opportunity to talk about the character of Cat. Yeah. So this is one of those things that I think is really well written about this, and and decent performance from Danny John Jules as well. Oh, yeah. I know you're saying he's not an actor; he was no. a dancer. Yeah. And this is. This is a, a, a physical performance. This idea that the cat, you know, how would a cat in human form behave in, in a feline way? So, you know, he pulls out his mirror and he looks at himself. And then two minutes later, he still, he wants to have another look just to make sure he's all right. And then the line he says, he's, he's happy with these cigarettes. He says, this is my best lucky find that I have ever found in the whole of today. <laughs> yeah. That is just beautiful short-term catism. Uh you're gonna put these cigarettes back, aren't you? Are you crazy? This is my all-time best lucky find I ever found in the whole of today. I really like this character. Yeah, I've slagged off Danny John Jules a little bit. I don't think he's a very good actor, but embodies the role. And I think, you know, combined with him and the writing, if you were gonna do, okay, it's like, it's a cat anthropomorphized, a human cat. There's so mm. many ways you could do that in a very cliched way. Mm. And even though they managed to hit a few like obvious things, the whole embodiment is something different. It's and it's, it's just really like he's he's not moving around like a cat, but he's moving around in a sort of slinky, catty way. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. vain in a sort of way a cat yeah. just preens itself. He just sleeps all the. Yeah. He's selfish and lazy, you know. Yeah. It, but it works. It's it's a I think really it's great. I, I I'm really curious. Maybe you know how much of that's on the page. How much of mm. that is Danny John Jules? Because it's such a physical performance. Well, famously, they, they, you know, they auditioned for it and he was the first person to audition uh, and he turned up half an hour late, but he didn't realize that he was late. So he just walked in with total confidence, like he didn't care that he was late. Uh -huh. And then, so he like immediately set up the right kind of level for the cat. <laughs> and he put, on his, he put on his dad's old zoot suit and, <laughs> and like came in and just, he just said he went for it, you know. And yeah. they, he was the first person they saw, and uh, like then they, they wanted him immediately, and they had to kind of. This is the, like, the costumes are fabulous. And, mm. and I, I just kind of love the, like, I, I love the concept of this evolution of, of cats over three million years in a human environment. So, therefore, they have, you know, natural yeah. selection has made them more human. Mm. And, and, you know, part of that is they've learned how to tailor great threads because <laughs> that would be part of it. That would be part of how a cat would, uh, would thrive in a human environment. I love it. I think it's great. And in the first series, you know, basically he's got one suit, but in about eight different colours. Like, there's actually not much variation to it. In the second yeah. series, they have much more going on. And then like after that, you know, they really go like so crazy with his uh, costumes. Yeah. But yeah, in this first one, it is very much just like a sort of 70s <laughs> suit. With, uh, with Here's a colors. question. Why has he got an American accent? I think that's just probably what he just turned up and did it like that. I don't know if there's any <laughs> real reason for it. Maybe the, I'm, never, uh, I'm never really clear on that. I don't know. I like wonder James if they Brown. address that in the books because in the in the novels that they wrote, they they released two novels quite early on. First one in 1989, the next next one in 1990. They're basically based around these early series and the plot. Mm -hmm. But it's not a novelization of the episodes. No, in that I, sense. I had it's, those books. I read yeah. them, and, and it was it was a, a kind of it was almost like here is some more information for you. But it wasn't quite canon. It didn't kind of slot. It was almost like the TV programs were were snapshots of this world. The novel yeah. was the world. I don't know how much of this they had in their kind of heads in background knowledge when they wrote the series, or if they mm. expanded it out. But basically what the novels do is allow them to flesh out the backstory and tell stories that they just couldn't visually do on a yeah. TV budget. But it, it, it allowed them to really expand that world. So we see that Lister just sort of got drunk one day and woke up 
on a moon of Saturn. And so the mm -hmm. whole point of his character is to try and get back to Earth. And he can't yes. afford it. And so he joins this mining ship because he's like, oh, well, it's going to go back to Earth. I'll just work my passage back to Earth. Mm -hmm. Gets on board and they're like, oh, yeah, it takes us five years to get to Earth. So um, he's like, oh, my God. The other really great thing, which is not mentioned in the series at all, but makes perfect sense and adds up completely, is that Lister's plan is, okay, if I've got to be stuck on this ship for a few years, what can I do that's going to get me put into stasis? St if I go into stasis... I won't lose That's any time right. out of my life. And so what he, he he looks in the regulations, okay, if I bring an animal on board and quarantined, yeah. I'll get put in stasis. But I have the, I'm going to have the cat checked for disease. I'm going to make sure it's all right because yeah, I yeah. don't want to put anyone... Because Lister's a good person. And so that's clever. When he gets caught by sending his photos to the development lab with his cat, uh -huh. it's all part... It shows how clever Lister is. And that's another crucial element to that character, that he is actually really yeah. smart. He's not educated particularly. He's not academic. But he's very... He's emotionally intelligent. You know, he's very in tune mm. with his emotions. But also... He's really wise. He's street smart. And you get to yeah. see more and more of yeah. that as he has to kind of, he, he gets put into a position where he has to prove himself and, and you know, use so his brain. And it, that's another really important part of the character and another important part of the conflict with, with Rimmer because Rimmer has the academic and the, the proper background in that sense, but he's not particularly smart. He's just, <laughs> he's just uh, trundling along. Shall we go back to our episode? So they're, they're laying on their bunks and they're chatting and basically... Lister is trying to persuade Rimmer to let him have four hours with Kachansky. Mm. So uh, the setup is that the ship can only sustain one hologram, and that's Rimmer. And in order to activate Kachansky, Rimmer would have to be switched off. And Rimmer doesn't trust Lister to switch him back mm. on. I think that's fairly reasonable. <laughs> but this is, this is another interesting concept with that whole kind of Lister is a good person. If Lister went to Holly and said, look, I want to turn Rimmer off. We all hate him, and I'm going to bring someone else back. They'd mm. do it. Like, they've got the power to... Like, Holly's got the ultimate power, and he's yeah. mates with Lister, and he's not with Rimmer. Yeah. But Lister respects that Rimmer is a, a living entity, is a sentient yeah. being, albeit a yeah. hologrammatic creation. So he's not going to kill him. Like, he, no, he wouldn't, wouldn't do that. Him. He wouldn't do that. But this is, this is without getting too philosophical about it, I, I did sort of play this out in my head, and I thought, if he's a man of his honour and he would turn Rimmer back on, that, that means turning Kachansky off. Yeah. <laughs> that means giving her four hours of life and then killing her. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one, that, isn't it? <laughs> And not for the first or last time, an interesting philosophical question from the dwarf. <laughs> yeah. But we don't get to that point because Rimmer just point blank refuses. No, 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 no. So at this point, Lister threatens to pass the officer exam, to take and pass the officer exam so that he'll outrank Rimmer and then he can, he can do whatever the hell he likes. Yeah. Which is a great idea. Mm -hmm. Again, it's kind of using yeah. his street smarts to go, okay, how can I beat this guy? Yeah. But Rimmer isn't concerned. Because there's no way Lister's going to actually study and pass the officer's exam. He's too lazy. Until Lister says, oh, it's the chef's exam. Yeah. And there's a sort of look on Rimmer's face like, oh, <laughs> that he could actually do. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, so we're only about 12 minutes in when that actual plot line kicks in. Yeah. Uh, which, yeah. you know, obviously everything that's come before is playing into that. It's playing into this balance of power. So the next scene we have, the next morning, Rimmer wakes up. He's up an atom, but he's slept in. Holly's not woken him up. Lister's mm. already up and gone. And we get a little bit of, I, I, I'm afraid to say, we get a little bit of bad acting here from Chris Barry. He, he, he says, uh, Holly, give me a cold shower. And then he sort of acts having a cold shower. <laughs> well how would you do it he said well i wouldn't i'm not an actor <laughs> but you know it's it's you know the rubbing the shoulders and then he has he has peterson's arm which we don't really get any explanation for but it's foreshadowing the fact that you know the holograms the personalities can go in different bodies and so yes, on yes so yes but Peterson's arm pokes him in the eyes and then punches Lovely him. Lovely bit of physical comedy, really. He does, it, he does a nice job of all that. He, he does okay with the, with the poking in the eyes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's pretty good. But yeah, I wasn't very impressed with the, the cold shell. <laughs> <laughs> we then go to the drive room and Kat is getting fish from the vending machine. Fish! This is how... The fish! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and what I like about that is he gets as many portions as he can possibly carry and, and walks away with them and, and sort of hides them, which is, a, which is very feline. It's perfect. Yeah, it's the comedy rule of six. <laughs> he got, he got six <laughs> Just repeat the line six times. <laughs> but it is funny. It's great. It's great work. <laughs> And of course, really who who is the voice of the food dispenser? Well, the voice of the food vendor is Tony Hawks. Yeah, who who we also see in the Better Than Life episode. Yep. We see him in the flesh. 
He's in a, some episodes later on as well. But yeah, he was a stand-up comic or more of a sketch comedian back then, wasn't he? And he mm. most famously did that stutter rap, Morris Myron <laughs> and the Majors, which I'm fairly sure you couldn't do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it breaks my heart and we're not on the chart Because the record's nearly over when the vocals start And I'm down and out and I'm down on my luck And I'm living on my own and I'm dying for a friend to say You're oh, great! But I'm under the hammer because all I seem to do is Come on, man. The reason Tony Hawks appears in Red Dwarf so often is because he was the warm-up man for the filming. Was he? Yes. Right. He was the Felix Felix Bonus of uh, of Red Dwarf. Yes, exactly. And which is so like whenever they just needed a voice, they would get him in, and then they were like, yeah, he was around, so they were like, okay, you be in that. He's in Backwards in series three. He's Caligula in series five in Meltdown. I think that's five, mm-hmm. four, maybe. Uh, so you know, he crops up quite a lot. Well, speaking of speaking of the supporting mechanical cast, let's talk about the Scutters. Mm-hmm. What what do you make of the Scutters? I think as so many things in Red Dwarf, it's something that was great on paper, but mm-hmm. the actual practical application of it uh-huh. proved to be more difficult than they anticipated. Yeah, but I think they actually they work. You know, the the stories are that they were terrible to work with. What Moody wouldn't come out of their trailer? <laughs> yeah, they they were demanding uh, more money. <laughs> but the, the the problem seemed to be that you know they built them. And got them working and everything. It was great. Brought them to set, and there was just too much radio interference in the area. So they ah, were they were they just would like not do what you told them to on the radio control. Uh, and so there were there were problems with that. But I think they're a nice addition. It's like a nice, okay, yeah. There's little droids that run around doing stuff. I like the idea that Rimmer Rimmer wants the whole ship running efficiently, but he can't touch anything. So he yeah. needs he needs these little machines to be his hands. Mm. And you know they are either not as efficient as you would like or uncooperative or both. And I like the tension that creates. Yeah. That's interesting, though, that Rimmer can't touch anything. Uh, that's kind of the whole concept of the hologram. They they don't really directly address it, but I think it really feeds into his character in that sense of frustration. He can't just do what yeah. he wants. Uh, and I, I like that. I like that it's kind of just part of the character rather than them trying to like make a big plot they point out of it, it one week, you know. But then he still manages to be completely um, afraid of physical injury. <laughs> like he's still a complete coward, <laughs> even, though, yeah. even though he's not really at any risk. Uh, yeah, and the, and there's the scutters were these little droids that buzzed around, but then they had. What is that? I mean, it looks like a sort of angle poise lamp on <laughs> yeah, the so skeleton of a of a radio controlled car. Yeah, pretty much. I think that's basically what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we're talking about props. I've just thought in the Better Than Life episode, when they go into the game, they put these headsets on and they are very clearly cycling helmets painted green and with glitter on. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the Scuttles also had a... They were, for close-ups of just the head, like the grippy bit, were, were like a glove puppet, which obviously that worked a lot better. So you could show it mm-hmm. sticking twos up at Rimmer or playing a, a, yeah, a yeah. keyboard. That, that was very obviously someone's hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, even those elements, like for me, I guess it's like people who like the old Doctor Who. It's, it's kind of that that kind of cheap nature of it. It's just sure. charming in some way. It's kind I of think that's nice. fine. Yeah, I think I think that's part of the charm, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we, we've 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 talked quite a lot about Rimmer. Let's talk about Chris Barry. Yeah, give me his background. So, so as opposed to the others, he was well, he was an impressionist. So I know he worked on Spitting Image. And if you mm. ever see any old Spitting Image footage from the eighties, you will totally hear Rimmer. And you could kind of get away with that when when you didn't know who he was. Yeah. But then when, you could just hear Rimmer. After, you know, because he, he was still working on Spitting Image after Red Dwarf. Mm. And all you could hear was, well, that's not Jeffrey Howell, that's Rimmer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think. Uh, I know what you mean, yeah. But that was his stock in trade. He was an impressionist. Uh, so obviously yeah. Spitting Image was your bread and butter back those days. But he would, yeah. he would perform like a stand-up act as impressions, mm. basically just doing Kenneth Williams uh, as much as possible. Well, that's how Steve that's started. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, lots of people. Back in the 80s, that's how you did it. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, oh, you're a stand-up? Who do you do? Uh, the thing I miss about being president is Mrs. Thatcher. Often a time I'd watch her cute ass wiggle up the gangplank. <laughs> <laughs> and I would think to myself, Ron? It's a pity it's just her country you're screwing. (laughs) 
uh, yeah, and so he did that voice acting, all that sort of stuff. He did he, but he worked on on so Spitting Image, which Grant and Naylor were writers on. He he was a voice on Son of Cliche, which Grant and Naylor wrote. He was on Carrots Lib, which was written largely by Grant and yeah, Naylor. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, you know, he he he'd worked with them a lot, and he'd also worked with Paul Jackson. He he's in The Young Ones. He's yeah. he was in Happy Families. Uh, he's in Filthy Rich Cat he was Flap. In Filthy Rich we, Cat we Flap. Saw recently. Yes, we saw him there. Uh, he's in. He does quite a notable appearance in Blackadder. Uh, Blackadder the third. Yeah. Go on. So that me. was just the year before Red Dwarf. Nob and Nobility. He's the. He's a French revolutionary. I have rescued an aristocrat from the clutches of the evil revolutionaries. Please take me to the ambassador. No, I won't. <laughs> I am an evil revolutionary and have murdered the ambassador and have turned him into pate. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, that, that was that. And, and so this was his first... Like this was his big chance to really kind of create a character and and just be a single entity and 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 mm-hmm. but he, you know he'd worked his way up to it like it was yeah he, yeah he this was his first it, starring yeah. role but he earned it and that's why I think he clashed with the likes of Craig Charles who was some young kid who was more interested in getting drunk <laughs> than uh, any yeah. concept of what acting is yeah. You know, like I said, we'll we'll talk about what he did to, after this uh, another time. But you know, the British Empire is probably his other big, well-known yeah. character. That was ninety-one that started, so it didn't take long for him to find another vehicle. Whereas the others didn't really, you know. Although, having said that, Danny John Jules, he was a dancer, like we said, and this was his big breakthrough as an actor. But you know, he'd been he was he was on he was in the original cast for Starlight Express. You know, he was oh, wow. he was a well he's a working dancer out there in the real sure. world. You know, he's well, and he's he just was, a guy out of a uh, dance school. Yeah, yeah, and he did voices. He like he turns up in things like Labyrinth. He was the voice of a couple of the the puppets in, in that, <sighs> like for one of the songs. He's in Little Shop of Horrors, like and just in the background. Oh, yeah. He's in a Wham video, <laughs> Dancing with George right, Michael, okay. like things like that. You know, he's he's out there. He's working. Okay, that's interesting because I, I know, obviously I knew he was a dancer, but I just thought I don't know anything about dancing and the just, career structure of a dancer. Yeah. I just thought he was just a geezer who'd come out of stage school and there you go, son. He's out there. On <laughs> that's the, good. On that's the good West to know. End, so you know. he was he was already had a career. And, and so just in terms of other things they were doing around this time, off the back of this, he got the ro- a role in Maid Marian and Her Merry Men, which. For someone yes. of my age, uh, you're a bit too old. Yeah. But for someone of my age, I, that I, is I, like I, I didn't. I know Tony Robinson, and yeah. I, I, but it, I was just a little bit too old for it. Yeah, I watched a couple of clips last night, just sort of as a research thing, and it was like a massive hit of nostalgia. Like these actors, I'm like, oh my god, I remember that person. I remember this character. Looked him up. Yeah. Never seen him in anything else. It's like, okay, yeah. this is what I remember yeah. you from. So that was a weird, vague nostalgia thing for me. It's been so long since I watched mm. any of that. I'm not sure if it quite measures up. To, maybe it's just how it's a kids' TV show. Things, You've yeah. changed, uh, yeah. But the it's Danny John Jules and Tony Robinson, people who are famous for one role and then not being very good actors for the rest of their careers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the, and even the woman who plays Maid Marian like retired and became a gardener. <laughs> it's like they're not, <laughs> none of them are actors. It's <laughs> it's just sort of weird anarchic comedy. <laughs> but you know, it's fun. Uh, interestingly, though, just while we're talking about Danny John Jules and the cat there. The reason that Craig Charles originally heard about this was because mm. they wrote the cat as a black character, and, and they right. they wanted because they wanted to be kind of cool and fa- and and, oh and sexy, God. and they were like, okay, well that should be a black. <laughs> These guy, two right? white fellas wrote this. Yeah, right? exactly. And so Paul Jackson sort of flagged this up and was like, hang on, is this racist? Should we be worried about this? And this is the eighties, you know. So it's like you know, uh-huh. you've got to be yeah. right on, you know. And so that's why Paul Jackson when. Look, I know a young black guy who's really got his finger on the pulse of the young people. And he sent the script to Craig Charles to go, have a read of this. Just flag up anything that might seem a bit dodge. And he said, no, it's fine. Um, Who's playing Lister? Because I'm interested. (laughs) And that's basically how, you know, they ended up auditioning him. So he was the racism consultant. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which was, (laughs) so he was, he was the producer's token black friend. (laughs) Yeah. That's exactly what he was. 
it's interesting that they wrote that character of the cat with kind of with that in mind. It's like, yeah, pretty sure that is racist, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but they, they guess, guess they get away with it. Let's go back to the episode. And we, we find ourselves now in the teaching room. There's a big sign up says that says teaching room. I don't know why you're not classroom. But <laughs> what is it know. in Esperanto, though? <laughs> yeah, good question. I, very similar set to their quarters, just with no bunks. So I, I think it might have been just a reconstructed <laughs> same, walls, uh, yeah. same wall. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Lister's studying. He's trying to. He's trying to learn. Rimmer's now getting a bit worried because if Lister passes this exam, then you know he is the lowest of the low. Yeah. But we get the. You know, Lister presents his terms. You know, if you give me four hours with Kachansky, I won't take this exam, and you retain your slender grip on power. Mm. So then we we cut to um, we cut back to the teaching room later and we see <laughs> Lister's taking a cake out of the oven which therefore he is doing his chef's exam that's how we uh, signify <laughs> his chef's exam he's taking a cake out of the oven actually he's taking he's taking like a big what look, appears to be like a bowl of of vegetables out of a microwave because <laughs> it's the future yeah. do you know what I, I say he's taking a cake out of an oven I mean I'm being generous there it's, I, I don't know what the hell it is but he's taking a food stuff out of uh, a vessel in, in which it has been warmed. It's the future, Gareth. It's all microwaves. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, sure. Of course. <laughs> well, anyway, he ends up burning his hand because he is surprised by Claire Grogan as Kachansky, who yes. walks in. Um, and and it, it appears that Rimmer has taken him up on, on the offer and said, you know, if you don't take this exam, you're going to have four hours with Kachansky. Yes. Well, Claire Grogan... A- again, not an actor. <laughs> yeah, not an actor. And it's it's apparent. Um, actually not the first person cast as Kachansky so really the original actor who was cast was called Alexandra Pig uh, and she was going to play the role but like we I did sort of allude to earlier basically the the whole show was ready to go and there was an electrician strike in 1987 and they rehearsed every episode but they just couldn't film right and so when that stopped it was like, look, the money like they thought it was all just going to fall apart look we got so close and it's now it's not going to happen hmm but I think they've kind of pot committed, you know, they spent so much money on it. They were just like, okay, let's just, okay, here's some yeah. more money, get it filmed. And, but by that point, Alexandra Pig was committed to something else. Uh, and so they recast and they, they brought Claire Grogan in because she was kind of feisty and, and chirpy, you know, like the right kind of energy. Mm. But here's the thing about Kachansky. When, when we look at the Kachansky character as it's, she is described, she's an officer. Yeah. She's officer class. Out, she's out of his league. Yeah, she's out of Lister's league. Rimmer, Rimmer thinks she's a snob because she looks down on him, and she's yeah, but that's Rimmer. <laughs> like everybody looks down on Rimmer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like I he... don't know that we take his opinion. I, I, I read, I read that as you know, Rimmer's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's very much supposed to be. She is one of the officer class, and sure. so she's in a different kind of elite league. Yes. That is not what we get from Claire Grogan's performance, is it? Because no, no. she's got a Glaswegian accent for a start. <laughs> like, that's not... <laughs> well, that's racist. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a posh Glasgow accent, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a Danish accent, so she'd, she'd be glad of small mercy. <laughs> she behaves like Lister's kind of girl. Yeah, like exactly. She's, you know, she's working class like him rather than yeah. officer class. And we don't see much of her, frankly. And even in this episode, what we see of her isn't her. You know, so we can't judge on that. Well, we see her in Stasis Leak in series two, don't we? Yeah. Uh, more of her of her character. Mm. And yeah, she she well, she seems very happy with Lister. Let's put it that way. And that relationship in series one just exists in Lister's head, mm. and and it's fine there. But it feels like in reality it wouldn't work. Well, in episode one, what we see of her is Lister comes up and he's a bit flirtatious with her, basically, and mm. she's yeah. she's seems happy with that. It's not just like a weird, creepy guy like coming onto her. So yeah. it's like you can see there's a little bit of potential chemistry there. But even that, the scene that we actually get is a, is a trimmed down from what was scripted and filmed because right. the chemistry wasn't there, <laughs> like basically. Oh, wow, really? And it seems like that was perhaps more on Craig Charles just wasn't very comfortable at being this kind of romantic lead type <laughs> as opposed to... Uh, but yeah, I, you need a bit more chemistry there. But also that is something they changed. So in the later series, the backstory is they were in a relationship for a while and she dumped him. But they have oh, a bit more right. of a history. But whereas, you know, in these early series, it's his crush. He's barely spoken to her. And she is kind of out of his league, you know, in, in different ways. So 
it's more of a frustration there but it's it's still a nice conceit and i think like we've talked about lister being quite a quite a pure of heart character the mm. fact that he believes in love and this happy ending that he's gonna yeah. you know have his love and grow, have a farm in fiji it's in keeping with what we know of him and i think it all works to that extent when he's talking about kachansky he's talking about love and being with her rather than like sex you know it's it's all very pleasant <laughs> So when finally we get this scene with Claire Grogan, we get to see a little bit more of that. But of course, it's not Kachansky. It's not Kachansky. It's <laughs> Rimmer in Kachansky's body. And so yeah. we're not really seeing the character here. And it's, I mean, it's immediately obvious, right? T- to the viewer. I don't know about immediately. I think there's enough of a, enough of a build up to it that we kind of go, okay, it's Kachansky. They're going to talk. But then Lister works yeah. it out pretty quickly just because of the way she's, yeah. she's speaking, the sort of things she's speaking and the sort of behavior. Yeah. So I think it's a really nice, as much as like you say, Claire Grogan is no particular fine actor, but it's a nice embodiment. It's just got those Rimmer-esque qualities. Obviously the lines are Rimmer's. I like the last line that gives it away. Oh. When she, <laughs> she misremembers something. So it didn't mean anything to you then? What didn't? You know, when we made love on the snooker table behind the bins. Never told me that. I thought you might have noticed. Oh, yes, yes, I remember now. We've never made love. Go away, Rimmer. Look, look, I'm a bit out of sorts at the moment. I'm having a woman's period. <laughs> That's really, that, has, that has entered my lexicon. Like, I, I never just say a period. Uh-huh. It's a woman's period. Like, that has, <laughs> has been in my life. Brilliant. Since. It is great. It's a nice little bit of work. It's nicely written and everything. Mm-hmm. Claire Grogan, yeah, she was, she was in Gregory's Girl. And she yeah. she did act, but she was a singer. Mm-hmm. You know, that was what she was famous for. She was in... Yeah, Altered Images. She was Altered Images, yeah. But... Uh, did you know this is a in, here's a little fact that I found out about Claire Grogan? Gary Kemp wrote the song "True," so true. Uh, funny how it's oh, yeah. that one. That's about Claire Grogan. It was basically about his. He had a crush on Claire Grogan, and oh, so, okay. So, so I was going to say, were they in a relationship, or was he just just like Lister? It was, yeah, it was unrequited. Like they met in the music scene, and he really liked her, and then she wasn't like bothered enough and so <laughs> that was that is a song of kind of unrequited love wanting to write a love song but right. you know he's finding it hard to write the next line <laughs> so yeah that was my interesting little claire grogan fact look we're coming towards <laughs> the end of the episode so let's let's go to the last scene okay kachansky turns back into rimmer and then we we sort of go out to the corridor where lister's getting his results and rimmer's saying you know how did you do lister how did you do and he turns around and he said, how did you do, Mr. Lister, sir? <laughs> and that's the punchline to the episode. Nice freeze frame. So now, now, now that's it. The dynamic has changed. The power, <laughs> the power is now with Lister, except we never come back to that. We never, it's never really referred to in future episodes. It is. Well, Holly refers to in the intro of the next episode, he says, the most exciting thing that happened recently is Lister pretended to pass his exam when he didn't. <laughs> yeah okay so they do kind of acknowledge it and just go okay forget that we're just back to status quo yeah, yeah. <laughs> interestingly do you know why that uh, episode ends on a freeze frame like that not for dramatic <laughs> is it is it because lister fell over it's because he landed really badly and hurt his back <laughs> and so <laughs> you can see it in the outtakes <laughs> where he basically lands and goes ah oh! <laughs> and then like couldn't do it again because he hurt himself <laughs> that is interesting because I did think it was odd. I mean, I, I mentioned it, I noticed it because it looked like some sort of eighties high school movie <laughs> moment. You know. Well, there's another it just one. Seemed a bit weird at the end of series two, episode Crichton, in which there's a freeze frame when Crichton's going to yeah. go off. That's because the space bike that he was supposed to zoom off on just looked crap, basically. <laughs> so right. So we, we spo- it was supposed out. to zoom off into space. So it didn't. Didn't. It didn't I see. So so yeah, that's our episode. I think what I would like to do is just. There are 12 episodes, six in series one, six in series two. I just want to quickly go through those six episodes and not not a review like we've just done, but just the concept of each episode, because I think this is a real, this is the strength of that writing. So series one, first episode is the end. We get that lovely setup, as we talked about earlier, the stasis, the evolution of the cat, the hologram, mm. all those pieces that are put nicely together and then just dropped back into place for our setup. Mm-hmm. Second episode is Future Echoes, where they're approaching the speed of light and we get these little timey-wimey things where they're seeing, they're having conversations with themselves in the future. That's a nice little concept. A proper sci-fi concept. 
Very much so, yeah, very much so. And this is what I mean about those those sort of high concepts that they just slip in and they make jokes about and they create this half hour of comedy about, but really interesting stuff. That was a, a point of contention, though, in the writing because they wanted to write a sci-fi show and the yeah. BBC said, look, nobody wants to watch sci-fi, no, it's especially not a sitcom sci-fi. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody mm. wants that. So they would, that first series is much more sitcom Balance of Power, the episode mm. we just looked at, is... That could just as easily be two people working together. You know, it's like, sure. okay, you've got the hologram stuff and all that, but, you know, the character stuff, it's all very character-driven. Yeah. Uh, but they wanted to use more sci-fi concepts, and Future Echoes was actually, I think, the fourth or fifth one that they filmed, and they brought it forward oh, okay. because they really liked it, and it worked, and they thought, let's throw some sci-fi in there. But that was the one they could get away with. And then in later right. series, they were kind of got a bit more freedom to do more sci-fi ideas interesting grant and Naylor had a policy of like okay very early on they decided no aliens it's been done like yeah. like what how what can we do that's new there well that didn't last <laughs> well it does there's no aliens in Red Dwarf. i suppose i'm thinking of the the the, the gelfs that we see but they're genetically they get around it everything is human derived because if you go into aliens then it's just anything but if everything's kind of humanoid or you know designed from human bases or you know from the you know we've got we've got the future to play with so anything can happen kind of thing but they stuck with no aliens and and their original concept was to not make it a sort of monster of the week thing where some baddie Uh comes in and they're they can't more series four and five like that's a bit more along those lines yeah yeah. But in these early ones, they wanted to make sure it was character driven, coming from an emotional place, you know, internal conflicts rather than external conflicts. And I think it does very much so in these first. Well, two let series. me let me go back to yeah. let me go back to this list, because I think I think you're right that that balance between sci fi concept and character driven comedy is the is what works about Red Dwarf. So the fourth episode is Waiting for God, which is more of an exploration of the the cat mm. backstory and the cat religion which i think it, i mean that's not really sci-fi so much as fantasy but 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 it's a really interesting meditation on religion that yeah, might be a yeah. bit too heavy but but it's it's really it's a really interesting take yeah i'm god but it's a bit of a drag actually yeah exactly lister lister is the cat's god called cloister yeah episode five i think this is brilliant confidence and paranoia lister gets some space bug so he's sick but his hallucinations start playing out we see we see a, a rain of fish and then we have the sort of classic angel and the devil on the shoulder. So he manifests his confidence, who's played by Craig Ferguson, interestingly, and his paranoia, who's played by Lee Corns. And it's like I say, it's an old trope of the angel and the devil on the shoulder. Mm. But it's played out in this kind of, you know, we've, we've given it a little um, sci-fi twist. And it plays out really interestingly. His confidence tries to kill him because he's overconfident. Yeah. And his his paranoia tries to undermine him. It's it's a really interesting um, yeah. episode, that one. Yeah, great concept. And But even that, like, when confidence and paranoia turn up, it's about 17 minutes into the episode. They're not they're <laughs> yes. not going, this is our episode this week, we're going to rely on that. There's a whole build-up to it. It all kind of yeah. travels perfectly yeah. well. Episode six is Me Too. So that's where we get a second Rimmer hologram. And this is the first of many times that Rimmer sabotages himself. So, you know, it's the dream, isn't it? You've got another version of yourself. You can get more done. It's great. And of course, they end up completely sabotaging each other because he hates himself. So he hates another version of himself just as much. And what a great concept, though. Yeah, if there was another you, would you get on? No, yeah. obviously not. <laughs> no, no, no because, yeah, exactly. Especially if you were as uh, self-loathing as Arnold Rimmer. Yeah. So before we go into series two, let's talk about the differences that came between series one and two. So what the, the most obvious change here is series one takes place on Red Dwarf. We're in the drive room, we're in the bunk. Mm-hmm. Series two, almost every episode... Oh, we're going off somewhere. <laughs> like we're off. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a they, they come up with some methodology to yeah. do an outside broadcast. <laughs> Which was, was, obviously you need to expand that world. Uh, I think the BBC wanted them to do that as well because this set was a bit crap and it's not selling as well as they wanted it to. So mm-hmm. with those models already built and everything, they had a bit more money to throw around and so they could do these kind of outside mm. broadcasts and stuff. And so that's one of the major changes. They just get off that ship. The other major change... Uh, apart from they've put a lot more color into the set uh, and like better mm. costume and stuff like that, the cat is integrated a lot more. That episode yes. we've just looked at, Balance of yes. Power. If the cat wasn't in that, it basically wouldn't matter. And yeah, yeah they've got right. you've got the Waiting for God episode, and the cat is there. It's an, he's a character and he's important, but he's very rarely integral. It's, he's he's feline. He he wanders in and out. Yes, yes. 
the beauty of that is the growth of the character of Cat really makes sense as a character that he becomes more human as he's hanging out with these humans yes. and he becomes more integrated. I don't think that was necessarily a long-term plan, but that's how it worked out. And series two, mm. they've got him in there. He's a lot more involved. He's not just a side character that pops in. He's part of the team. But I also think you have a, you, you talked about how the, uh, they expanded the physical universe because you can only do so much in three sets. Yeah. You said the same about, you can only do so much with three characters. Oh, yeah. You need to have that fourth character bringing something more to the party. And, and, and you know, in later series, we see Crichton added as a fifth character, yeah. which is just an extension of the same logic. And in, in series two, a lot more kind of other people coming in for one reason yes. or another. Yeah. Well, well, Crichton is relevant because the first episode of series two is Crichton. And we, we are introduced to Crichton. They find another ship and they think they've found some, some women. Uh, but of course, it turns out that the, there's three... Uh, women who've been marooned on a planet are all dead. Crichton is their android manservant who is has been trying to look after them even though they've been dead for centuries. Yeah. And that's a really interesting introduction of, of the character of Crichton. And going back to what I was saying about these nice sci-fi concepts, they, they sort of rush it through in half an hour, but it's the idea of an android who's designed to serve. And when he no longer has anyone to serve, how, what does he do? Mm. What, what, what is left for him? And, you know, the episode plays out with him breaking his programming and he disappears. And, you know, that's the end of Crichton. We don't see him again. Obviously, in series three, they decide to bring him back, but but it's a it's an interesting concept. Yeah, and interesting when they bring him back, the sort of the long term journey of that character is him breaking his programming and kind of trying mm, to become. Yeah, more we human. we kind of go. It feels to me like they 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 played that half hour out as a single episode, and they thought, well, we can do more with yeah. that. And and yeah, like and I said, works, that's really the long term nice journey of Crichton when he come, when he returns. Crichton was played by a different actor in that first in that that episode, wasn't he? Yeah, he was played by a, uh, an actor called David Ross, who uh, had worked with the writers previously on some radio stuff, and they so they sort of asked him specifically to come and do it. But the, the funny thing about that is that he was a proper legit actor, you know, like he uh, yeah. And so he came into this rehearsal space with these people who were not actors and they were messing about and he kind of forced them to raise their game a little bit. So I think having him there having <laughs> right. him come in at series 2 uh, right early the first week just to sort of slap them into action a little bit was probably a good idea. So do you know why he didn't return? Yep, they had every intention they wanted him back. Uh, when they decided to keep Crichton, and he just wasn't available, he was working in the theatre. Right. So they had to bring. So for Robert Llewellyn, that was the big break, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about Robert Llewellyn when we when we yeah. return to Red Dwarf. Back to series two. So the first episode, Crichton. The second episode is better than life, as discussed, where they get these virtual reality uh, headsets, bike helmets, mm -hmm. and you know we explore their psyche, which again is a great concept. And that means you can you can go on to Earth because it's just like it's, you can go into yeah. the real world. Exactly. But the, the, the punchline of this episode is that Rimmer sabotages himself because yeah. he hates himself so much. And and that impact on everyone, he basically spoils everyone else's fun too, <laughs> because that's Rimmer. That's Rimmer's personality. He's, he's toxic. Yeah. <laughs> the third episode is Thanks for the Memory. And this is this is a really interesting, I, I think this is a, probably of all of them, this is the highest concept where Rimmer decides, sorry, Lister decides to give Rimmer the gift mm. of a memory of a girlfriend. And it all goes horribly wrong because Rimmer is Rimmer. And instead of having happy memories of his girlfriend, all he remembers is the fact that she dumped him and the rest of his life has been awful. And so it's bookended by the fact that they're trying to bury, they bury the memory and they, we start the episode by their missing five days of time yeah. and the rest of the episodes I'm working out. But, but what an amazing concept that is for a BBC sitcom to implant memories mm. To have the best of intentions. And what you were saying earlier about Lister being a good guy. He's so sorry for what he's done here. He's really genuinely trying to do, yeah. do a good thing for Rimmer. And he realises it hasn't worked. And he's really, really sorry. To the point where he's prepared to erase his own memories of, of the, <laughs> the, whole, the whole episode. Yeah, it's a nice concept. That, that episode, for some reason, never quite works for me. It's the, the structure of it or something doesn't, doesn't give it time to breathe. It always feels a bit too kind of rushed somehow. I'm not, I haven't quite worked out what I don't like about it, but... I think that's partly a problem with a lot of these episodes, be precisely because they're trying to deal with these really big issues yeah. in, in a 25-minute you know, sitcom. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's real good character growth there, and the relationship between Lister and Rimmer is, is developed there mm. as well. Episode four is Stasis Leak, which we have mentioned. And this is where they get, there's another timey-wimey one, but they've basically got a window into the past. And and we kind of see them go into the past and he's trying to, he thinks he's going to marry Kachans because he finds a wedding picture. Yeah. But it turns out that that's another future lister. And it's a little bit back to the future, this one, where you've kind of got 
different timelines and different things interfering with each other. That's quite an interesting one. That's another one where there's so much more to be done there. It's like you could yeah. make a series yeah. about because Lister sees Peterson and he's like overjoyed to see him and like you ha- you've been alone or well, not kind of alone but you know like this mm. is a window to the past you could relive things you could go and mm. try and fix things which they do and mm. it's just like it never quite works like Rimmer tries to convince the past Rimmer to go into stasis and it just doesn't it just doesn't work once and so that like that's the end of it you know yeah. there's there's sort of so many more possibilities to happen there yeah I get you but again, I think that's just the, the nature of the format, isn't yeah, it? Of course. But there's a really, there's a really funny scene in this where they they walk through the Stasis League and they're in the gent showers, yeah. and uh, they're all kind of standing in the showers, and and the the joke is that Cat says, "What is it?" <laughs> yeah. And Lister tries to explain it, and then he goes to Rimmer, "What is it?" And the joke is that he just doesn't understand, no matter how many times they explain it. That's really good exposition. <laughs> yeah, that is a really funny way to tell us what's happening by telling us six times what's happening in a funny way i i, was, I thought with my little um britcom pod hat on i thought that is an excellent way to do exposition <laughs> what is it it's a rent in the space-time continuum what is it the stasis room freezes time you know it makes time stand still so when whenever you have a leak it must preserve whatever it's leaked into when it's leaked into this room what is it? Um, it's a singularity, a point in the universe where the normal laws of space and time don't apply. What is it? <laughs> oh, a magic door. Well, why didn't you say? The fifth episode is Queeg, which we mentioned. So that's when Holly has, has lost his mind and is replaced by the backup computer, Queeg. Mm. And he, you know, he treats them like, like dirt, like a, you know, it's like... Um, an officer and a gentleman. He's like a, a, a drill sergeant. Yeah. And of course, the, the punchline is at the end, Holly comes back and says, uh, oh yeah, I got you all April Fool type of thing. And and they're all so relieved to have Holly back. So it's, uh, it's Holly just making sure they understand exactly what they've got. The interesting thing about that is um, that was written as a concept. Well, let's do an episode based on Holly. They mm. got the whole thing, but didn't know how to end it. They didn't know how to wrap it up. And ah. having it being a practical joke and it was Holly all along, was a tacked on ending. It was not planned from the start. Oh, that's interesting. Which doesn't make sense, does it? Because it feels like that's the whole point. Like that twist yes. ending makes everything work. But that was not the concept at all. <laughs> that, was, that was their rug pull. But interestingly though, that's the, really interesting. the guy playing Queeg there, Charles Organs, uh, he's a choreographer primarily, he does acting and sort of musical theatre okay. sort of stuff, but he's a choreographer mostly. And so Danny John Jules knew him. Uh, he's like, <laughs> you know, he was a bit of a mentor. So he's put Danny John Jules through his paces. Yeah, and so at the Series 1 rap, party i think it was danny john jules brought him along as a kind of like hey come along to this party so they all met him the writers met him and like that's what he's like he's like that's as a dance teacher he's a drill instructor like he's Mm -hmm. very firm and like and they were like this is a fascinating character let's write something for him and so that's that's where that came along there's also a really funny scene in that episode where chris barry does impressions of holly and of lister and i and i thought well that's going to come in handy for the audio books isn't it mate (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so obviously chris barry can do the voices so uh, that was uh, that was exciting. that was the uh that was the edited version as well he did a lot more other voices that he was just throwing in there but they all got cut out for time but yeah oh, it's, uh, so he did he does the voice so the final episode of series two of this this brief run that we've looked at is parallel universe mm. where they go to a Parallel universe, and they find a, a, an alternate version of the crew. So there's a female Lister, Rimmer, Holly, as we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. And instead of cat, we have a dog character. Yeah, and yes. much hilarity ensues from that. But that is that is that is really funny, and again, a nice concept, but perhaps not quite the high sci-fi concept so much as an interesting sociological. Yeah, character character concept. How, well, how yeah. would the world be different if it was a female centric world? And it's it does. <laughs> It kind of really plays on a very surface level. It never quite gets into any deep notions. It's more just like, oh, well, women are really sexually aggressive. <laughs> and, and, and once again, Rimmer, Rimmer gets his comeuppance by being confronted by another version of him, who is awful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but of course, famously, Parallel Universe starts with a musical number. Uh, oh, yeah, which turns yeah. out to be a dream sequence, basically. But that's so that's interesting. So yeah, we get this tongue-tied song, and it's a it's a sort of big song and dance number. 
we then zoom out and and Cat's looking at uh, this dream machine. He's looking at one of his dreams. But then it's never referenced again. So what the hell was that? Was that just like, we've got some money to spend, let's do a song and dance number? Yeah, I think it was just a sort of silly, funny thing. (laughs) And they thought like, look, Danny can sing and dance. Let's let's do something with that. And so the the guy who choreographed that was Charles Organs, who played Queeg. So they they obviously, they were working with him, so they got him in. Uh, But then the problem with that is it took so long to do that and to try and choreograph that, that they didn't properly rehearse the rest of the episode so uh, yeah they uh, but that's it's a bit of an infamous kind of moment in the show is just as a kind of weird little silly thing yeah it's very odd it's very peculiar and you can tell like craig charles was not comfortable uh, doing this dance number chris barry is obviously not good at it but craig charles is just uncomfortable and you can see it on his Mm. face like he just doesn't want to be there at all but strangely enough just as a sort of postscript to all that did you know Danny John Jewels, as credited as the cat, released that as a single. Get away. It, and not even at the time, in 1993, I think it was. Really? Like five years after that episode came out, basically, in 1993, they released it as a single, but it was a new mix. Blimey. It's a bit slower, it's not even as catchy. A new mix. <laughs> Do me a favor. <laughs> when I saw you for the first time, first time. my knees began to quiver. But it got to number 17 in the charts, I'll have you know. Really? Yeah, and there's a music Man, video. I'm gobsmacked by that. <laughs> yeah, and all that, the that other... That was back when the charts meant something. Yeah, and the other cast are in the music video as well. So did that coincide with a new series coming out then? Was that was that was it part of a promotional? I, I mean, I'm sure they timed it for that, but there, there didn't seem to be any purpose to it. It's, it's not really a Red Dwarf vehicle. It's just, it's just, I don't know, you finally had the juice to get a record out, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Well, look. So, so, so there. I so quickly run through those twelve episodes, and I think I think the the common theme is some really great ideas mm. executed pretty well in the constraints of a sitcom. Yeah. But I think this is the real strength of of certainly these early years of Red Dwarf. It's those really great, those really big ideas. But ultimately, it's just two antagonists battling it out. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and it is. I think for the most part, it is a really good balance. A couple of other things I think we should talk about before we finish sure. Red Dwarf. Firstly, why can't you pronounce dwarf? <laughs> I can. Red dwarf. Red dwarf. Red dwarf. That was it. Dwarf. That's good. It's dwarf. Red. Red dwarf. Oh my god. <laughs> so I'm sorry, listeners. I he can't. He can't do it. But hopefully, it hasn't been too uh, too distracting. Red dwarf. What's wrong the, with that? Red dwarf. Or whatever the hell that is. The other. The other point that I wanted to raise was. The language, the the insults oh, yeah. specifically that that are used in this Red Dwarf universe. Mm. So obviously, Smeghead is is the one you know that everyone would come up with first. But there's loads of them. There's there's goits and gimboids. There's Gwenlins. Yes. Now I know what Gwenlins is because we talked about that in which episode of oh, our I don't program know. was it? Well, go on, tell us what tell us why Gwenlin is an insult. Well, Gareth Gwenlin was a producer at the BBC and has done lots of work mm. over the years. And he basically said this is crap and it won't work. <laughs> so they, to the, it, so the I writers didn't remember like it. Was, it was one foot in the grave because he, he, he directed some of one uh, foot in the right. grave. Didn't yes, he? maybe. Yeah. yeah, so we talked about it then. Yeah. So he, yeah, he'd said this wouldn't work. Which, you apparently know, apparently that upset the writers. Certainly wasn't the only one to say that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even after it was made. Interestingly, the. Uh, so the first two series both came out in 1988, a very quick turnaround. But like I said, the first series was delayed because of the electrician strike. Mm-hmm. But the they commissioned the second series before the first series went out. Now, for such a kind of unusual experimental thing that wasn't necessarily going to plan, that was an unusual thing to do. But yeah. the rumor is, or the legend has it, how true this is, we don't know. But the legend has it that the commissioning editor who was leaving the job wanted to make sure that his successor had some real crap to deal with. <laughs> so he recommissioned it for a second series. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's true. <laughs> but yeah, the, the language is is fascinating, really, because I, I guess for me, I've grown up with it. So you just accept it. But you just, you understand what it all means. There's, there's no, it's all insults. It's, the, you know, it's, it's just it's getting the right cadence, swearing. isn't it? Yeah. You understand. It reminded me of in, in Battlestar Galactica, where they used frack instead of... Yeah the other word which i won't say um and and they just used it in exactly the same way so because you're saying frack off uh it, it, it's all right it's perfectly yeah, acceptable it's like but but you know exactly what they are saying yeah. and likewise when someone says smeghead you you it, it's the cadence of swearing you can fill in your own gaps there 
But it also it sort of helps to establish that this is not mm. the 1980s. It's yeah. like a different world, isn't it? In the same way that Lister is a fan of, oh God, what's the name of the sport that he likes? Zero G, zero G football. football yeah. Isn't it? yeah. So he's not, you know, he's not a soccer fan. He's a zero G football fan. It's just, it, it, it's not quite our world. It's a, it's a just, it's a, well, it's a sci-fi world and they have different swear words. That's the other thing about Red Dwarf is it was a mainstream success. But it's got a cult following. You know, there, like more than anything else we've talked about, you know, you've got Steptoe and Son, Faulty Towers, huge fan community that still love that completely today. But yeah. Red Dwarf had a fan community that are kind of obsessive. And it's, and it's something yeah. that really comes with sci-fi stuff for whatever reason, this kind of cult mm. following. I'm not sure why that is particularly. But Red Dwarf definitely has that. Certainly. I'm a little bit worried about releasing this episode. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because if we've got anything factually incorrect, we're going to be for the eye jump. <laughs> well, that, that's it, isn't it? We can't... If you're, if you're one of those really, like, uh, completely obsessive Red Dwarf fans, we're not, there's nothing we're going to tell you that you don't already know. <laughs> so it's, sure. it's, you know, it's no, no good to you. But it's an interesting one when you are approaching something like, oh, I want to look at the show and kind of give the history of it. There's too much there. Because... Red Dwarf mm. has such a following that they've churned out so much material. Mm. They put they were doing DVD commentaries as soon as that was a thing. You yeah. know, you've got a cast commentary on there. There's been loads yeah. of outtakes and, and behind the scenes material, loads of retrospectives with interviews with all the people that were involved. So just researching this was like difficult. And I've watched it all before. Mm. <laughs> you know, I've done it all before. Yeah. Well, I, I, like, I think you're right. I think if you've got someone who is, a, is one of those obsessive fans, no, that's insulting. I don't mean it sounds old. Someone who's a fan who's watched everything, then maybe they're not learning anything new from us today. But hopefully for our sort of general listeners who, who are just fans of sitcoms, this has been interesting. Yeah. And, you know, certainly for me, it was, you know, if I can summarize my take on Red Dwarf or certainly early Red Dwarf, I was worried because we recently watched Sean's show. Yes. Which I had very fond memories of from not long after this. And, you know, I really, really didn't enjoy it. I was I was seriously worried that I was going to watch these and it would ruin a good old chunk of my childhood memories. It did not. It holds up. It held up for me. I think objectively it's a funny sitcom. It's got those great big ideas. It sometimes struggles to fit them into that half hour, but it deals with things mm. that, that Dear John doesn't. It, it's, it's got great thoughtful writing, but ultimately it is two antagonists battling for supremacy and that is great sitcom fodder and always will be. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I'm not going to go as far to say I like, I prefer series one to what comes later because there's enough problems with it that mm. it doesn't quite work. But the, the character stuff there, I really do yeah. like it and the ideas. One day in the future, we'll, we'll come back to, to later Red Dwarf, uh, the, the yeah. kind of the, the prime years, series three to six. I'll watch all them again and see how much I actually want to gush about them then. <laughs> now I've rewatched these. Yeah. Interestingly though, yeah. They brought it back for series seven and eight, and then that kind of didn't go anywhere. Ten years later, again, they bring it back, and then that yeah. went well enough that they've been doing it for ten years now on Dave. Mm. They've been re they've been bringing it back. Yeah. I haven't really seen any of that later stuff. Me neither. And I say that as someone who's... I said at the beginning of this episode, Red Dwarf is one of my favourite sitcoms, but I haven't gone to the effort of searching that stuff out. And, you know, I could. It's not hard to get to. This is interesting, isn't the it? The fact that I haven't, perhaps says something about me but i i don't need to see these characters again i've got those first six series that i'm a fan of and it's that's all i need you know i yeah. <laughs> but having said that for the most part those later stuff they've been doing have been really well received that's why they keep doing them so mm. but bear in mind so, okay, so this started in 1988 right that makes it 34 yeah. years now and the last the last yeah. big production they did was in 2020 that's 32 years that means they're only five yeah. years away from last of the summer wine numbers <laughs> that that ran for 37 years no, it's I, I think they'll i think they'll keep doing it i don't think anybody who's involved wants to to stop doing it uh, rob grant walked away in the 90s and but doug naylor carried has carried it on and the the actors aren't doing anything else well look we'll 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 talk about future series in we've got plenty more uh sitcoms to look at yes. before we'll get to that Well, thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed our retrospective view of the first two series of Red Dwarf. If you've got any comments or questions, or if you're a, a Red Dwarf fan who wants to desperately tell us that we got something wrong, then please <laughs> contact us on social media. You can get us on Instagram or Twitter, at BritComPod, or we are also on Facebook. Thanks all, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.